<laughs> it is April the 17th, 2021, and this is The Future of Photography. The Future of Photography. Woohoo! We're back with the whole team. Hey, how's everyone doing? Splendid. Good. Splendid. Yeah, go. Walking and talking. <laughs> that's that's a, good, yeah. a good goal to have. It's a good thing to it have. Is. Um yeah, we've had we've had interesting episodes recently talking about a lot of virtual stuff and NFC uh, NFC NF, no, NFTs, uh, non-fungible tokens and and pretend f- things. <laughs> pretend th- well <laughs> Let's not go into that rabbit hole again, but um, uh, the majority of our photography is a virtual thing, right? It happens by some pixels collecting light on a sensor, and that gets transformed in weird ways into uh, whatever digital format, and then there's a RAW file, and then there might be a JPEG, and then there might be uh, stuff and and moving pictures and stuff, but it's kind of uh, this strange not real thing because it lives in the cloud or it lives on a memory chip or something so for this episode we thought we would like to talk a bit about making those photos a bit more touchable how about that i'm gonna talk about atoms rather than digits actual Um, atoms you know (laughs) things that you could we just thought it would be good to bring things down to earth Things you can touch. Photography uh, ending up as objects. And the objects themselves have a a very special quality. (laughs) Ah, yes. I I don't know if anybody uh, noticed, maybe I've brought this up before, but any photograph that's, say, over 50 years old, that uh, even probably less, that you hold in your hand and look at, even something that you may find on the street, something that wherein the images have no direct connection to family or friends. They're just, but it's old and it, it is an Mm. object that you hold that has a very special quality. It's fascinating in and of itself. And the older the photograph, that quality uh, pretends a greater um, connection between, you know, the passage of time, aging, those in the photograph dead, all of that really is is a reverberation that I, I don't think you feel the same way when you look at an object image on a screen. I, I'm not sure I know why, but um, holding a photograph in one's hand is a very distinct experience. It's also distinct from holding a, a book of photographs in one's hand. The photograph of as object is something that's always fascinated me from the very uh, beginning. And so as committed to digital work as I I am, and uh, by the way, please visit my website, uh, (laughs) chetrick.com, because I've put a whole pile of new work uh, on it. I won't claim that it's anything but very digital. Um, I continue to explore print. So I I thought it would be an interesting conversation to move away from the abstract into that tangible stuff and just maybe do a a quick brief, I'll run through sort of the history of of printing and how we get there. And then everybody chime in to your own experiences of how you um, initially were introduced to the print when you were young and, and how it's evolved now, if at all. Um, you know, uh, uh, at the beginning, you know, we, we were using coated metal plates, daguerreotype, uh, Nadar uh, started, you know, basically coating metal plates with photosensitive material, exposing those in camera and using highly toxic chemicals um, without masks, I may <laughs> Of course. We should talk about that, actually, because printing, <laughs> printing used to be dangerous, didn't it? <laughs> Printing was very really, dangerous, really yeah, toxic. very toxic, yeah, process, and uh, life yeah. expectancy was mm. uh, much lower then. Uh, anyway, mm. th- those photographers probably worked in factories when they were 11, you know, evolved <laughs> into, you know, a, a DIY aspect of, of toxicity. But um, moving along, that photosensitive process, you had to be half scientist or more than half scientist and a little bit of artistry. And of course, people were really, really encouraged once they saw 
images of themselves true to form that were not commissioned as royal portraits painted, but actual um, memorabilia. And, and those daguerreotypes seen today are as fresh as they were when they were shot. They are amazing. I have a few and uh, I'll never, I never get over how amazing the quality is. And also, those photographs are impossible to duplicate digitally. Yeah, they're one of a kind. Uh, you, you, yeah. And, and not only that, the image may be duplicable, but, but the actual object, the sheen, the, the, the tonal mm. uh, resonance of it is, is very powerful. And, and, and so photography at that point was, was not for the faint uh, of heart. Um, then as we, as we kind of progressed further and it became a little more easy, you could coat a medium, um, with salt and, and photosensitive materials that weren't as toxic, um, and contact print them using the sun, bright light. And that, that again, gave way to kind of an experience of people who are more, um, hobbyists or, 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 um, Science based and interested in that, uh, and that that fluidity between art and science kind of grew. But when Kodak started to make consumer cameras, um, the the big breakthrough was you finished the twelve or ten or eight uh, photographs in the camera, and you sent it to Kodak. And the operative word is. <laughs> Gee, I hope these turn out. <laughs> oh, <yes. laughs> that was something that <laughs> people yeah. always did. Some did, some didn't. And and but mm -hmm. you took the picture, sent it away, and then it arrived uh, in mm. in a form that was relatively inexpensive and easy. Um, and that evolved to let's send it to the drugstore. We don't have to send it all the way across the world or across the country. We send it to the drugstore. Same thing. I hope these turn out. Um, and the drugstore gave away. I don't know if it was the same thing in Europe, but, but that was a place where people did usually bring their photographs to a camera store, or to yeah. a drugstore. And then we had the mm. advent of one hour photos. Who remembers those? Yeah, yeah. In America, the road for me. <laughs> every, every corner yeah. had a one hour photo. Um, so yeah. that was very breakthrough. You take your picture, now 35, drop it off. And you, you know, for me personally, I really hated one hour photos because I hated, <laughs> I hated the plastic prints. I hated the paper, the material. It felt. And, and the complete lack of control, right? <laughs> Completely. I mean, you never, like, <laughs> colors were off. And, you, like, you were always asking, was it me? Or is it the machine? Is or is this the person rushing? Uh, yeah. <laughs> to get it done in an hour. Yeah, all those little people. <laughs> yeah. Were, so that was, you know, that was um, not a great experience. And slowly it gave way to those of us who have become really interested in photography as experimenting in the dark room. As a reaction to that, we wanted to develop our own, you know, initially black and white development. And with those kinds of, oh, I think I had a Omega uh, enlarger. I think it was that call that and and you know those um uh tanks to develop 135 or or 120 uh contact printing um uh contact prints and reading them and getting a loop and then making an exposure those were uh, life-changing experiences for me I, I, like i um you know began my so-called career in photography as a printer uh, printer for um, initially, you know, myself, but uh, I did get a job as an assistant in a very, very high end dark room for a rare books um, library in at the University of Toronto. And, and they they were tasked with printing all of their glass negatives um, wow. whether it's blowing them up or whatnot. They had specialty enlargers, mm. all kinds of archival uh, printing materials and washing materials and drying materials. And so that opened up my world to archival printing and fine quality uh, printing very, very early. And the when the 
uh, head of the dark room left, they, like, they by by accident, I, I I got to really play in what was then a million dollar dark room and and learned how to print. <laughs> It's a good place really, to learn. Really well, <laughs> it yes, was yeah. really, really good. So mm. when I opened my own studio, I call it a, yeah, it was my own studio and uh, basically doing art. Um, I had, you know, I was living in basically a ramshackle place uh, that I kind of converted a, a one, uh, a space in a loft to a dark room and spent a lot of time there um, learning and, and exploring dodging, burning, and all of those. Never printed in color. But that really opened up my world to photography and the relationship of the print to the image capture. And that, that I think, was interesting. After that, you had the, the experience of uh, dye sublimation, dye transfer prints. Now, those are things that were very difficult to do on one's own. But you know, generally around us, you would find one or two labs or, or facilities that would do color dye transfer. So, so now when, when talking about dye sublimation, that is, that is built into a plastic box. You press a button and out comes a photo. Um, Correct. Was that one, back then a manual process? <laughs> Sorry, Adrian? Yes. So I was going to say, I, I have one in, yeah, right, yeah, just but, off camera. I, ha I have yeah, my they're easy to have, but, printer, which I well, use all the time. But back then, was that a manual hmm. process, Jeremiah? Was that uh, something? It was, that a, manu manu it was okay. a manual process. Di Dice was a, uh, or die transfer was a manual process. Right. I, I remember working with a lab on this. Um, each, each color, effectively, would be printed. Right. On top of each other, and the it's a bit like screen screen printing, printing but for for, for photos with photographic mm -hmm. with continuous tone, and and so um, without getting into the weeds about continuous tone and yeah, that's tone, that's <laughs> we, we, we'll leave that for <laughs> Adrian. You can do that show, um, okay? <laughs> uh, but but the dye sublimation, uh, which eventually gave. Uh, way to Cibachrome printing were very high end, absolutely stunningly beautiful color depth transfer. And and even though in Ciba the 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 prints had a sort of plasticity to the surface, it was more inviting, more like looking through glass. And I still I still have a uh, big quality, big uh framed prints there in storage now of of zebra chromes that are done by a master printer can i say share a uh, spare a thought for your framer when you're making cyber chrome print? oh yeah tough because tough they are so painful yes <laughs> or anything like that that you can't breathe on it's really difficult to work yes with. for framers <laughs> it was always the like yeah. whoa oh no Be because, and <laughs> no, I'll, no, I'll explain grand. why for our for our <laughs> no, listeners. We, we, we took it all because on. of the plasticity of it, <laughs> you couldn't do a hot mount of the print to a solid board uh, because it would melt the yeah. print. Ah. So things had to yeah. be done, and if Seba is pretty long lasting, um, it would have to be done archivally by hand, basically mounted yeah, yeah. Um, with gloves. Yeah, because fingerprints would last. Forever. Oh. Um, oh my God! But out of that, um, there was Canon developed a a version of die sub uh, printing, um, and it, it was a printer. I had one, very small, small, made eight by tens, but the there was no ink. It was rollers of separate colors, and you fed in those plastic sheets, and it it went through its mechanized version. And effectively burned it onto the print. Those were stunning prints, absolutely beautiful. Paper was expensive. I think you know back then it was like every, you didn't want to screw up a print because uh, of the cost. Um, parallel to that, you had this kind of explosion of dot matrix printing, and then some of uh, you know us guys would go like, "I wonder what our, <laughs> a raw photo." you know, snapped out would look in the dot matrix. And of course that gave way to what we now would consider retro eight bit kind of fun looking images that are, that are very kind of uh, deconstructed and an aesthetic selling very well as NFTs, I might say, um, <laughs> but we, <won't laughs> 
<laughs> so uh, um, the, the, the dot matrix, of course, then uh, flew into the world of final, finer nozzles, better inks, better software uh, for more continuous tone. And, and there were, you know, Canon, HP, I think Ryko is involved, but uh, the, the, there was a few other printers that uh, pretty well fit, fell by the wayside and, and the dominant became Canon and HP and yeah. they remain the consumer printers uh, of note to this day. I, I worked they, at HP at the time when those things came up. Unfortunately, not in the printing department though, but uh, it was fun to take a peek over the wall and, uh, and look into their secret <laughs> rooms with uh, the future products and stuff. It was always exciting, yeah. I would say they're still doing exciting work on bo both companies. Um, you know, I have my own uh, feelings about which ones I like better. And, and the cost of inks is, of course, um, an issue now. Um, but alongside, you had Hanemuel um, developing beautiful, they've been making papers for several hundred years now, I believe. Oh, and by the and, way, and, just, just just to interject, uh, to, to make sure we're not getting any any angry mails, of course, Epson is also out there, just to, yes, name, to name the is, third is big there. one, who, who uh, yeah, I sure. think arguably has the has a big, big chunk great, of really the market right now. Solid, uh, yes. yes, and Epson, I do apologize. Uh, please don't write me nasty <laughs> letters. I've had Epson <laughs> printers, and I've been very happy with them. Um, What's happened now is you have a, 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 a this perfect, I want to call it storm, but it's more of a just unity of paper manufacturers who are now working in archival and sustainable media. Um, most notably, I think Hanamuel bamboo papers are absolutely sp spectacular pr papers. I, I mean, just on every level. They're not like, oh, we're going to use a sustainable paper and sacrifice anything. It's quite the opposite. Those papers are amazing. Um, and you have inks um, that are being developed that have very, very uh, high lev levels of accepted archival quality. So you have that. Um, and so with nozzle um nozzle research of finer, finer dots and all of the rest of it, you arrive at um, the kind of printing that, in, in my estimation, supersedes and goes beyond what darkroom printing had been. Oh, it that's is, an intro. That's a, that's a strong claim, isn't it? Because I will throw that down and compete on any level. That's <laughs> Well, but, I mean, you'd have to define your your, your quality, quality measures first of all, wouldn't you? But, I mean, you, you talk – it's – because there's a lot, there's still quite a lot of evolution and experimental experimentation in in darkroom printing, especially on the the sustainability side. You know, are people printing with anything from? You know, I mean, we we've possibly all heard of Caffanol, the you know, developer you can make using coffee. But that people are that there's a lot of people out there now trying to develop things made out of cabbage and cauliflower and broccoli. And I don't say, I mean, I, I those are jokes, obviously. And I, but I don't say that in a disrespectful way. There's a lot of experimentation in that. Part. Part of the world mm. uh, the experimentation is is true on an individual basis but mm. corporately the the r d now on darkroom printing papers um and enlargers and even ke chemistry is really fallen by the wayside mm. it's it's niche products and you don't have the advance in r d that's happening in terms of inks and papers and before i i jump into kind of the ultimate which is going to be Uh, connected to my uh, particular pick of the week, um, there's other ways to print your pictures. There are uh, books. Now we have printed books that are absolutely great. You, you can put them together online. You can put them together through Lightroom. There's many different uh, companies that do it. They, they turn out absolutely beautifully. They're easy to do, and they're relatively inexpensive. And that is another form of really beautiful prints and a great way to experience one's photographs and to give away. Um, so I, I, I think that book printing um, whether you consider that offset printing or some of these new uh, high-end uh, fast printers that are, you know, basically using profiles that you can install in your software that really do match the printer 
And with a couple of uh, experiences uh, with book presses, you can, you're never going to get it exactly the way you make it at, at home or with a high quality printer at home, but you can get the feeling of it beautifully because there are paper choices and ink choices as well. And so all of those things and profiles do come into it. And for those who don't follow what profiles are, they're, they're a kind of um, uh, matching software that enables one to kind of pre-visualize um, one's work. It also sends signals to your printer uh, based on your paper and ink combinations. It, it pretty and much so makes sure that you get repeatable results with your hardware. Correct. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, and uh, anybody who's interested in, in printing themselves at, you know, at home, and I'm not talking about the because I, I did jump over the kind of small pr die sub printers or Polaroid printers that attach to your phone that that stream out beautifully uh, rendered photos for what they are, and um, there, there is a real um, encouraging movement to higher quality, better quality, better renditions, and longer permanence. So we're, we're in a very, very exciting time for printing and holding one's photograph and, and um, just, you know, developing, no pun intended, um, <laughs> a new way to experience uh, our, our photographs old and new. I, I think it's, it's a, a great time to, to be printing right now because there are so many so many options i mean you can buy relatively inexpensive printers for for but that can print amazing photographic quality and, and and give you a chance to experiment you can get stuff that is just designed simply to be fun you know like the the little instax printers that, you know that you can get you know, mm. take it take a single photo on your phone and print it out on an instax printer mm. you can print out five so that everybody can have the photo and things like that yeah, there's, yeah. there's so much going on so much choice um and it's been a little while since i've been to an actual you know photography show a uh, trade show type thing you've know, been out there on the exhibition floor but the, the the number of papers you can get the number of printing or companies be they you know one-off prints or books or or zines don't forget zines mm -hmm. zines are very oh, very yeah, uh you know uh, that's that's a a very interesting part of all of this as well um, and, uh, you know, all sorts of what things you can print. It's great, great opportunities around these days. So uh, I, I remember well, was probably 12 years ago, I spent uh, a week with um, HP in San Diego, and that's the place where they develop their, their inkjet printers. Um, and this is... Not an ad for HP. I think the others are, do, are doing the exact same <laughs> things. But um, this was also a place where they did all the testing for their um, for their permanence, for their image permanence. So, so mm -hmm. if you hang up a, a print on a wall, you want this to last. So you don't want this to be fading after a week or two. Mm -hmm. And um, they were they, this was this this really left a lasting impression on me because they were testing for the two main enemies of every every photograph out there and one is uv radiation sunlight and the other is uh, ozone in the air those two uh decompose the colors in those prints and uh i just remember how intense and uh, these, these big they had big ovens that were that had big uv lights in them and then they had chambers yeah. where they had uh had uh strips of paper swirling around in an ozone rich environment and they were kind of artificially aging those um, those prints and not just with their own inks but they bought all the com competitive inks all the competition inks and all the refill inks we'll get as well there. the cheap <laughs> yeah, refills the and yeah. <laughs> um, that's that's one place where i learned very quickly how how different your results can be depending on the choice of ink and paper and how those harm harmonize with each other and and uh, some of those refills are just fine for, for office type printing but um i've seen stuff that was in there for like a day and it was almost completely faded so it was, it was yes yeah, so th there are inks intense. that are cheap and cheerful and really really bad um mm. uh you know a, a, a sidebar to this is uh, i've been um as, as some of you know, uh, experimenting in my own printing um, 
which continues my obsession with it, uh, using uh, custom inks. Um, yes. Using uh, piezography, which I'll we can talk about later. Um, uh, it's basically zone system printing. So it's the equivalent where every single tone can be controlled in terms of its output uh, and its relationship to the paper too. So it's not only uh, how much in a particular zone of gray can be applied to a piece of paper, it's what how absorbent that piece of paper is and that will determine how much ink or how little ink is needed, whether it's glossy or, or, or matte. So there is um, sophisticated software, uh, RIPs basically, that will go from the computer to the printer and analyze. These are things that uh, the companies like HP and whatnot are violently against um, third party. It's always a, a battle uh, on my current um, printer. I, I, I needed to actually acquire <laughs> a, a motherboard. You are not using uh, original ink. Sorry, we cannot print. <laughs> I'm not, use, I'm not using original inks, and I'm not even using the, the uh, motherboard of the computer. I have a separate motherboard, which is hobbled into there and connected to the computer and allows uh, my, the translation of what I'm doing into the printer. But the prints are stunning. They're, they're, they're lithographic prints. And working with the ink maker, who's very artisanal, name is John Cohn, we've started to experiment in, in rather really um, amazing uh, kind of convergence of very old technology and very new technology. And by, what, by that, I mean taken um, some of my uh, digital work and um, basically converted it to a file. He's taken that file and, and burned a plate, a photosensitive plate, uh, continuous tone with that image after some adjustment, then it's baked and, and, and developed. So it's oven baked, developed, um, and stripped of its non-essential, uh, elements. And then, uh, paper is, um, f very, very fine paper soaked and, and, and allowed to dry partially. So it's damp. Then the plates are inked with uh, basically very, you know, hand ground, very high end lithography inks or intaglio inks wiped. And then the print is put through a intaglio press old school. So it's like a 16th century technology <laughs> using uh, high end digital technology. And uh, we did it for the first time. We don't know anybody else who's actually done it. And uh, we only worked on an eight by ten, but the results are they're they're dazzling because there there's no photographic element to the print at all. It's an intaglio gravure, uh, but it was born as a digital image. Um, and uh, <laughs> so we hope to press on with that, but it, it's not it's not for the faint of heart and it's not cheap. Color, he's done one in color, just a regular photograph with separations. But the matching of the plate and the paper is significant and very, wow. very tough. Um, so these things, this print took like two weeks to make. So you can go from the absurd to the ridiculous, uh, you know, from the little Polaroids to gravure printing. But it's all very exciting, as exciting as the capture is. But that, that I mean, that sounds, yeah, that, that's, that sounds fantastic. I mean, that really mm -hmm. is, you know, I mean, it's, it, it, it sounds like there's a lot of experimentation, a lot of, a lot of art, a lot of craft, you know, a lot of precision involved in something like that. Because, you know, I'm thinking, of this, you know, thinking, well, what does all this mean for the future of photography? You know, it's like, <laughs> and 
it's yeah because we, we've the, the, mm. there's so much history it's, it's part of me thinking well well where can you take it next and then there was a bit jeremiah where you said a few minutes ago oh uh, you know di- digital printing is now beyond where where darkroom printing can be uh at least uh, i may be paraphrasing a little bit there but that's that, that's certainly going to be um you know, stand by it uh, yeah no that fair enough you'll mm. yeah, i mean you, you're you're working with this stuff day in day out so yeah um, uh, I'm sure there will be people who have strong opinions uh, in the opposite direction as well. But Gallerists. It's, 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 quite possibly, yes, quite possibly. So, so yeah, because I think, because we talked a lot about the archival nature of stuff, and I don't really know what the 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 science of archival or, or the expectation of an archival print is these days uh, versus a consumer print. Um, uh, uh, and I'm thinking to myself, well, actually, uh, do do I do? Uh, and this may be a contentious as well. Do I care? Right. Because I've got prints and uh, most of them are prints from digital files. And if they fade or, or get lost or whatever, just I'll just print one. another one. I just put well, another one. You know that the 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 nature, the 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 reproducible nature of these things is is one thing. But if you have this really perfect print and you've spent a lot of time on that and got the exact right paper with the exact right inks and the yeah. exact right settings for your for your image processor, mm. then um, it isn't always as easy to repeat exactly the same thing. Printing is, no. is I found this when, when doing a lot of printing here myself that, I mean, you need to learn so many things about color management, about what, all this stuff that it isn't really that click of a button kind of thing you might get this from a Any, Canon selfie but. printer you know but but <laughs> uh, art art printing is difficult and um, the the image permanence nowadays of a good print with pigment inks on a on a decent uh, piece of paper that is really that is matched to the inks will exceed 200 years um, and that's not in the drawer but up on the wall in a room so um, That's pretty good. Image yeah. permanence is is amazing. is an amazing area of study, and mm-hmm. the the manufacturers it's, put a lot. Yeah, of oh yeah, it, it is. If you want, and especially if you want to be collected by any museum gallery right. or collector. Yes, because um, they're not going to want to spend tens of thousands of pounds on your original print photograph, <laughs> are they? And then five years later, have it disappear. No. Unless you're a ba- Banksy. And also, or- they're <laughs> going to. Go ahead, They're going to use the correct glass, no doubt, to um, help that process. Like to no, this was without you know, glass. The, this, the 200 it. years was without glass. So yeah, but I'm just saying that if uh, well, imagine if with good glass. Oh yeah, you could um, you could extend you, this almost yeah. indefinitely, you know, like yeah. UV glass or yeah, yes. yeah, 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 one of those. But like but also they say, uh, having explored how to um, how to make sure your photos last. I did a very deep dive several about five years ago into what is the best way to store an archive of huge of can of worms you're opening there. Oh, <laughs> oh yes, a very big can of worms. And so I, you know, I thought to myself, well, let's say I wanted to take my archive and which is a terabyte. We may have talked about this in the past too. I think yeah, we did. And, and the cost of it uh, with a real you know, like, uh, what is it, Mm -hmm. Uh, Iron Mountain, which does all, you know, hospital records here and government and IRS Mm -hmm. backups. And they have multiple facilities baked and carved into these mountains that can survive (laughs) nuclear attacks and all the rest of it. Um, And, you know, I thought, I'm just going to phone them up and say, what's a terabyte of my work, you know, on <laughs> Iron Mountain? And then they, they went, oh, you know, it's about $20,000. And I was like, whoa, a month. A year. <laughs> a month. <laughs> if you don't pay your bill, they wipe yeah. it. So, and, and, uh, and of course, you want to keep these things at the right humidity, temperature, and so on. Um, I've uh, we'll, we'll put a link in, in the show notes of the, the, the I think I talked about this here before the Eastman yeah. Eastman Museum Rochester Eastman uh, Museum's technical vault that I got a private tour in and we filmed it and um, that building that building is always 
um, pressurized. So there's always air flowing out of the building, filtered air that gets pumped in on one side with the right exact conditions mm -hmm. for these old cameras that go back to the first day of photography. And uh, and when you open the door, there's a little draft coming at you because they don't want anything to contaminate those shelves. All the shelves oh. are metal, uh, which are like um, painted with a special paint so that it doesn't contaminate anything. And it is just Fabulous. a lot of effort you have to put into these wow. things. But you I, know what was it? Oh, go ahead. I, I just think some of this, I think, is is possibly because I'm not a fine artist. I, I find it, it, it goes a little bit too far for me personally I, I know that this is you know very very important for for a lot of people and 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 for good reason but for me it, the thing i always try to measure this against and it, it may be as easier to make a comparison if if i talk about a story um and about a book and i know there are people that collect first edition books and those can be very valuable and 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 if they're old enough can be you know historically valuable as well as economically mm -hmm. valuable but for me I've never understood that because for me, it's it's the words, right? It's the content that are important of the book, not not the edition that I have. Um, and and again, I know that's going to be contentious in some levels. And if I try and put that to you know to photography, to try and transport that thinking to photography, the thing that I'm excited about in the future of photography and in the printing is that you know ninety nine percent of us who are interested in photography can get repeatable prints really easily and you know and can and can pick and choose what formats we print and you know i you know i have a little instax printer i have a little die sub printer i have a, a an inkjet printer which i never ever use uh for for printing photographs um and you know we can do we we can do all of these things, but we can do them multiple times. We can print books on demand and things like that. I, I think that I think that the 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 breadth of it of what's available to us as consumers, I think, is is phenomenal. Yeah, we're just and scratching don't underestimate, the surface. Don't underestimate the permanence of those little printers. I mean, uh, when I was beginning, I I, I was chosen by uh, a Polaroid. You know, as one of those. You know. Here, test out this new SX70 camera. And here's a... You're a aging yourself a little there, Jeremiah, I'm afraid. Box of film. Yeah, well, I was, you know, probably 22. I don't know. I don't know how they found me or why, but um, I have images uh, from those. Now, they're very faded and they're very cracked. They look like old paintings now. But they're still there. This is the first batch of SX-70 film, you know, which I brought to Guatemala and walked around Lake Atitlan and shot the Indians and gave them pictures and they sewed them onto their awesome. clothing when I came around. It's just <laughs> wild. Um, the, the, what I discovered in terms of photographic permanence when I talked about digital, almost to a person, everyone said, if you want to preserve your photographs, make a print. Keep or or chisel well them chisel them into a rock. How about that? Or <laughs> this was another thing. Speaking of that, mm -hmm. take the ones and zeros and etch them into a plate of titanium. Or put them in DNA. Bury. That will survive too. <laughs> okay. All right. I okay. think you know. I think um, this is the right spot to look at our picks of the week. And I would like to start with Emar today. So what did you bring us? Hey. I brought you a channel uh, by this lady. Uh, I just thought she had some nice processes for trying at home and, and they're all sustainable. Mm. So Studio Almondena Romero. Almondena Romero. And she seems to have done some work for the v &A Museum and stuff. There's a few clips there. But um, yeah, lovely. But now her plants are quite exotic looking, so I'm not sure how... Uh, doable this is in Ireland but <laughs> lovely mm, processes that's pretty amazing chlorophyll printing yeah chlorophyll yeah. printing and yeah interesting the chlorophyll and cyanotype yeah. yeah yeah I think the reason why I don't print actually I've been thinking about this as you were all talking there is um, I think I've seen so many nice prints that I, I know what it looks like when it's done well yeah and um, also I think I, I, a part of it is that I just don't ever feel like anything that I've got is like 
good enough to print. You know, you know when you have something that you want to print. You're wrong. Do you get me? I think your <laughs> stuff would look absolutely beautifully printed. Absolutely beautiful. In fact, send me a file that you like. I will make a print. For, I'll okay. make a print for you and send it to you. Oh, that's an offer you can't refuse. Oh, it it? I'm open to. I'm. I'm open to being convinced. Okay, that's, I'm open to. Imar, nice. Imar, I would. I would. I'll do that. I would take Jeremiah up on that for sure. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. And I'd say that one of the things that I've learned from. And also, I think. Sorry to interrupt, Adrian. I, I think um, if I was ever printing, it, it would be more if if I was intending on maybe selling prints. But like to me, uh, like if I had one picture that I love, love, loved, and I wanted to keep, you know, a print of myself, then yeah, I would have it printed. But aside from that, unless I was um, seeing it as some sort of a, a kind funny. of a, a business move, then I, I, that's the reason why I probably do, don't do, do you, it. Do both of you guys anyway. feel the same way? I, I mean, I, I always feel that a photograph is not complete until it's printed <laughs> I, I don't know why I, feel I, that, it's printed. I, I had a break from printing for yeah. years and got back into it more recently and the thing that I, I the, the thing that I'm learning is that you know it's it's important not to think of a print as as special right I, I mean it is special and it's great to have it and and what i mean mm. is don't don't think of it as only for special occasions don't think of it mm. as only my best images mm -hmm. and my best images are never I good agree. enough it's like print it you know it doesn't matter what kind of print it print it mm. hold it in your hand stick it on the wall leave it there for a couple of months live with it and if you like it great you can do a you can put more effort into the next print and and make that yeah. one the the artistic expression i like the, that the it's, it's more approachable wise like words approach. yeah okay. wise words yes yeah i do like that approach actually because even just you know having it in front of you on the wall yeah. like like you would in a studio or in your room it's a different experience so even we've just, all got out of yeah, practice for yeah. me for me printing we're back in the discussion but we'll continue with the fix in a second <laughs> uh for me the the um <laughs> The, the the photo doesn't necessarily have to be printed, but I I think it has more depth for me if I look at it on a beautiful medium. And with that, I, of course, mean either some nice paper lit well, that's important, or um, let's say the, the 5K Apple iMac display I'm sitting in front of, which, which has a very high resolution and a very good uh, color gamut. So it that that does something to my enjoyment of a picture but then on the other hand i can also especially if what's in the photo is important to me uh if it's not just a visual thing but if it's a it's a content thing then i will probably enjoy a photo of someone who's important to me on a smartphone almost as much hmm. anyway next in line is adrian what did you bring us? I brought you something from the bottom of a very deep technical rabbit hole that I've been enjoying. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> this in, in week. Colored gamut, colored gamut stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. So I, I um, uh, as, as regular listeners will know, I recently got a new MacBook and it's, uh, it's the first time I've had in a computer, at least, it's the first time I've had a, a, a wide gamut display. So it's a, a P3 gamut, I believe. And I've been and I've been shooting some bits of video just from you know, family outings and stuff like that, um, and and get diving back into DaVinci Resolve and and learning coloring and and editing again in DaVinci Resolve, relearning it, I should say, uh, and. I, I exported my carefully edited and coloured video and it looked very different when I played it than, than it did in DaVinci Resolve. And I thought, oh, God. And do you remember do you remember years and years ago when people first started to shoot raw more often and browsers didn't support colour profiles and, and, and it's everything? It's still the case most really, of the time. <laughs> everything would look. So, so I'm down that rabbit hole again for the first time in 12 years, but this time it's a video version mm. of it rather than a stills version of it. And my pick this mm. week um, is somebody who's really helped me out this week, um, helping me uh, understand... You all of the various different bits and bobs that need to be configured to get a much more consistent workflow for editing video when you're working on a wide gamut display like a, a modern 
uh, a modern MacBook or, or other modern computer and help me make sure that it's going to look reasonably okay on play, uh, you know, uh, just in general browsers, other people's phones, YouTube, Vimeo, that kind of thing. And it's a website called the postprocess.com. Uh, and I eventually ended up here after lots of research into all of this stuff. And they've got some really, a couple of really good articles and one link in the, in the show notes to go from there. Um, and even, you know, things like a free downloadable infographic that helps you set your DaVinci Resolve settings so that you can uh, you can make thing, sure things are consistent through your pipeline. So anybody that's trying... Is that like a profile? Yeah. So, well, yeah, like, like a bit like a profile. So, um, you know, color spaces for, for video, things like Rec 709 and things like, and Rec 2020 and, and some other things as so well. So that's a, that's a crash um, course in video color, color management. That is cool. It is a crash course. Yes, it is. And yeah. um, it's been very helpful to me. And I'd just like to give him a big shout out and say thank you for doing all the groundwork and writing it up so diligently. I have no idea who these people are, but mm -hmm. thank you. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much. Um, I'm taking the, the liberty to plug two things here. One is uh, my own, which um, again goes back to that visit at the Eastman Museum. And uh, in the museum, there is a uh, a place where you can play. There's a play room with, which has a cyanotype lab in there, a little one. So you can just use the materials, there's UV lights, you have stuff to put on the paper and then um, you get to expose something. It's usually, it's, it's supposed to be for kids, but there was no one there. So I was the kid and I was playing with this and <laughs> shown and we did a little teaching video showing people how to, uh, how to do a cyanotype, which, it's super simple, probably the simplest printing process available to us nowadays. Um, you don't even have to coat the paper yourself. You can just buy it. Usually it sells a solar paper. So um, that's a fairly simple. What is it What is it developing? In water. Just plain old water, uh, water, from, water from the tab. That's all you need. You, <clears throat> you can even put negatives on there and expose them in the sun and then just rinse them in water. And once you dry this, it ends up popping deep blues and bright whites and uh it's a very it's a very simple process it's not it's uh, i don't think not even dangerous so just um, wash yeah. your hands afterwards yeah i have, an, I have a photoshop um action <laughs> <That'll do. laughs> no it's not no. <laughs> okay second thing is uh, you, you have you have one guess what is the most photographed object on mars dust <laughs> nope Little green men. No, nope. the wheels or the the, the landing. The nose. rover. Uh, it's a yeah, part of the it? rover that is the most photographed one, and this has to do with well, indirectly with color management. Yeah. We're we're back with color management. It's the color target they put on the on the oh. rover. Um, it's a here's a better look oh. at it. It's um, a little aluminum in silver covered a silver coated and gold coated thing with color targets on it and um, this is an entire article about how they put this together how it was developed how it was tested how they keep it mm -hmm. free from dust magnets by the way because the red dust on mars is magnetic um, there's yeah. there's all sorts of science mm -hmm. that goes into this there's little inscriptions and symbols on it so it uh, talks about the meaning of those and um it's a, it's a, it's amazing and it's pretty much a gray card but uh bolted on a slightly special one. an expensive one yeah. a very, very expensive, expensive. One. It's, it's, it's like a gray card but it's gold <laughs> and it, yeah it's only it's gold gray coded and it's about and it's five million dollars. and it's attached to perseverance's butt so how about that um <laughs> Yeah, it, it's really, it's really cool. a, a detailed like article. I'm so happy about this. So um, that would I be my of pick of the week. And then last but by not the way, least, to that end, yeah, to that end. By, by the way, let's have a little a moment of silence for the perseverance, which is uh, which is struggling this week. Uh, they oh, really? shut everything down because of the dust storm. They've had to delay the helicopter flight and I shut see. everything down to basic, basic until they can get the the dust blown off it in a natural way because it's uh, not good. Oh dear. Hmm. So let, let's hope. Um, anyway, last but not least, Jeremiah, your turn. Uh, my pick is uh, one of my uh, most favorite uh, processes site. And, and uh, for those who are really serious about trying to explore 
uh, fine art printing is of the piezography uh, website, uh, which basically will address the printers that can be converted, how they're converted, what curves you need, the software, the inks that are available, as you can see, carbon, carbon neutral examples of these, um, and, and um, the possibility that you have for blending uh, the inks that you want. In other words, you could have your deep blacks being cold, you can have your midtones being warm, and you can have your highlights being selenium. So you you can you can really adjust them and give them a very very specific and unique look that um, is amazing. Of course, you have to load the um, you know load the cartridges yourself. You have to. Uh, make sure that you have applied the right uh, chips to those. So it, it, it's a uh, long and um, involved process, but once you've done it once, um, it's not as daunting. Jeremiah, um, do you know anybody uh, who does this as a commercial printing service? So, because I mean, that's quite an involved thing, isn't it? Um, I do. Clearly, very I, technical, I and it, yeah, it might be um, nice to just to get one. Right? I could imagine, sure. you know, that, that uh, just to see how how amazing these things are in real life. I th I believe uh, Candela uh, in Oakland. That that's the only place that I know. Okay. Um, personally, when I did uh, my last show, um, I did all the kind of seventeen twenty two printing here, but I had uh, some large prints that I wanted to do in piezo. I didn't have the stuff, and they have that and and work with the same inks or similar inks, and we're able to match uh, very large prints absolutely beautifully. Um, they're not cheap. But, <laughs> of course uh, not. Ken Kende Kendela, I, I believe that's what's... Let me just... Okay. <sighs> well, we are... We've reached the end of this episode, and um, just a quick reminder, everyone, um, this is also on video. We have our own... YouTube channel over on YouTube. It's linked in the show notes. If you're the, over there, just uh, do us a favor and click the little subscribe button and the bell and the stuff you have to do to help the um, to help the nice algorithm bell. to help the algorithm to um, to notice us a bit more. We need a few more subscribers. Mm. Would be nice. So, and if, if you're listening to this, hey, go on over and <laughs> do the same thing. Um, yeah, we will be back next week with more, uh, including um, yeah, maybe a more digital topic. I'm not sure yet. We haven't decided yet. But uh, until then, everyone, thanks for your time. Um, and uh, yeah, see you then. Bye bye. Yeah. Bye bye. bye Take care. You've been listening to The Future of Photography. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your other podcasts. Find the show notes and more information at thefutureofphotography.com. Mm -hmm.